record. Okay, so if you guys don't have any questions, I can start with chapter one. Any questions? And please stop me, jump in there, ask questions, don't be shy. Uh, that's not gonna work for you. All right, so again, I'm hoping that you have read some stuff. I'm just gonna go over some stuff. If you need me to explain more, you're gonna ask me. And uh, so we're gonna go from there. So first part of this chapter is talking about the computer system. I'm hoping that most of you have looked at that already. Uh, talking about the problem uh, solving, uh, we're gonna to touch how to do the C++ programming and testing and debugging that most likely I'm gonna leave that to you to read it in more detail. Okay, so when we're talking about the computers, we're talking about the hardware and we're talking about the software. Hardware is a physical computer. Software is the programs that are on the computers. And technically softwares do not exist in the world. Those are uh, virtual stuff. So uh, the physical things, and uh, virtual things, a physical one that it does exist in the world, virtual one, just like my name, does not actually, my name doesn't exist in the world. Uh, I, I live in the world, but not my name. So we talk more about that later. So we have uh, editors, translators, uh, system managers, uh, <clears throat> PC workstation mainframe. I'm not gonna go through those details. Uh, network, input device, output, CPU, main memory, and secondary memory. You should spend a lot of time in these things. They are going to show up in your uh, test on the Friday. So I'm going to go over this, uh, this one. It has a picture like this. So we can... So what do you think a CPU is? I think the CPU is like the brain, like it's the, it's the part of the computer that, that does whatever you tell it to do. That's what I think it is. Okay, anybody else? So take care of how the part of uh, the calculation compared to the GPC, the other easy one. What else? So every time we talk about the CPU central processing unit, uh, I'm hearing this as a brain of the computer. So one of the things that human brain does that they are, we are trying to get into computers to do is the actual thinking. So human can think. Computers cannot think. Eventually, they will do it. But if you go back to what is thinking and you want to analyze what the thinking is, if you ask me a question and I have the answer for you, the answer is actually stored in my brain somewhere. And when I'm talking to you, I go and reach that section of my brain. I get those information and bring it back to you. So when I'm think, talking to you, I'm constantly going and getting those information. And then I process it through how to tell you that information that I have. So the bottom line for the CPU is that uh, it will fetch and execute instructions. So CPU is going to have some instruction that's just going to execute. So it's just going to look at the instruction. It's going to execute those instructions. If you are computer science, you will take an assembly language that's going to be talking a lot more detail on these things. 
So when it needs its instruction, the instruction is actually in a hard drive. So we call them secondary memory. Hard drive is in a solid state. It is not the memory, although it's getting closer and closer to be there. So not everything is gonna fit in memory. Memories are expensive. We don't wanna pay $5,000 for a computer. So we get a hard drive, which was CD, DVD. Now it's turning into uh, more of a USB technology type of thing. Uh, and then we, uh, it's gonna bring it to the memory. So my CPU, the only thing that its CPU sees in the whole computer is this memory. It doesn't see anything else. The CPU doesn't know about my hard drive. It doesn't know about my USB drive. It doesn't know about the network. It doesn't know anything. That's why we call this main memory. So whatever instruction that the CPU wants to execute has to come from the main memory. So the operating system job is to go to the hard drive or anywhere else, bring the program, because the program doesn't fit in the memory, the memory is expensive, so we don't have a lot of it. It's gonna bring a piece of my program and put it in the memory. And from that memory, it's gonna bring one instruction and put it right here. So, and then CPU is gonna execute. And we're gonna look at some of them, just a sample, and that's, that's what's happening. And you're gonna spend a lot of time in this in assembly. So we're gonna cover some in a high level, and then we can get into more detail. So when I write a program, I'm gonna save, I'm gonna compile my program. I'm gonna, in C++, we're gonna make it as a binary. CPU only understand binary. Binary means what? Zero and one. Yeah. Zeros and one. So the language of the computer is only zero and one. So somewhere, somehow, my program that I'm writing in English has to be changed to zeros and ones. A long time ago, a programmer had to write stuff in zeros and ones. I'm telling you, it's not that pretty. And then they went to assembly language and they went to high level uh, programs that I am not worried about the binary thing. I'm just writing my program more like an English type and then the compiler is the one that's gonna be changing it to the binary. Since CPU is the main processing part of the computer, they don't want it to be busy all the time. So they came and create a mini CPU that's called ALU, Arithmetic Logic Unit. So the job of this ALU is just do the computation. So any computation that, so if, if, I, if I have an instruction over here that needs computation, then it's gonna be sent to ALU. And the interesting things about computers is not that they are not doing the things that the way, they are not doing things the way we are thinking. So we are thinking about multiplication. ALU doesn't know anything about multiplication. It knows about shifting, and adding, that's all it does, shifting and adding. So when it gets, so we have a byte, which is eight bits. So one bit is zero or one. And if I put eight of them together, I'm gonna to have a byte. We organize it in eight bits at a time, one byte. Uh, right now, when you say my machine is 64 bit machine, that means it has 64 divided by eight is eight byte. Every instruction is eight byte, 64 bit. One instruction is 64 bit. So uh, ALU is just gonna get that number or whatever it has. And all it does is shift it and add it. It does that for uh, subtraction, 
it does that for division, it does that for multiplication. So that's what the job of ALU is. So CPU is not gonna deal with it. It says, okay, you want calculation, go uh, send it to ALU and it's gonna do it for you. Main memory had uh, all the computers and we transitioning right now is when we turn off the computer, the main memory would go away. So it's not, uh, that's why we need hard drive and other devices to keep our stuff because the main memory is gonna go away. Remember CPU only sees main memory. So when I turn my computer back on, the main memory does not exist. So it has to fill it up. And that's the job of operating system. Again, if you are a CS student, you will take a class in operating system. You will take a class in assembly language and you will get more into these details of these things. So when I have my computer, I'm gonna have my input devices and my output devices. The standard input would be a keyboard. The standard output would be the monitor and the computer programs that we are gonna be compiling for this class all the way to the end, and if we have time, we can do the GUI, is console programs, meaning that we're gonna be displaying the output to the screen. We are not gonna make a graphical user interface from it. Any questions about this quick note on this one? Uh, yes, I have a question, Professor. Sure. I looked at my computer spec, the other class, then it says my computer has eight CPUs, then the four is a performance, and the other four is a efficiency. Then can you explain like what that it means? Say that again, it's eight and it's... Uh, eight, okay. Yeah, eight cores, then the four is performance, and the four is the four are on the efficiency. Then can you explain like how is different performance and efficiency in the CPU process? Okay, so uh, CPU, can only do one thing. So CPU can execute only one instruction. So that's all it can do. It cannot do any more than that. Now, they figure out that, okay, to make the program faster, maybe we need more CPUs. So for the mainframe and the bigger computers, they had more CPUs. So you have, uh, instead of doing one instruction at a time, you would have multiple instructions be going with multiple CPUs. But then with that, it would come complexity of it that which instruction goes to which CPU and when it's done, how do we put them together? Again, the detail of that is gonna be part of your operating system. Then the technology advanced and I said, okay, even though we have one CPU, we're gonna make this CPU, build it, engineer it, in a way that's gonna look like much bigger CPU. So one CPU is gonna be acting like eight CPU. So it has some division, it has some areas on that one. So, and because it's one CPU, it's gonna, the complexity of it is gonna be a little less. Of course, the operating system and all those things, if you get to that, and I'm not gonna to get to the detail of it. So now that we have a CPU divided into sections, then we can assign some different things to go to the different areas of the CPU. So that's where it says four of them is for this, four of them is for the other one, and that's the way it's assigned through the operating system. So that's what the core is about when they say it has eight core, it's just one that is acting like it's eight. And then four of them is gonna be responsible for doing this task, four of them are responsible to do this task. So if I have something coming into my CPU and it's gonna be about this area, it's gonna to go to that side. And it's about this area, you're gonna go to that side. So it's gonna be four in, in your orientation. If you were on a campus, you would go to the campus and say, I want the orientation. And they said, okay, if you're computer science, go to talk to that guy. If you are business, go talk to that lady over there. So that's what, basically separating tasks. I see, thank you much. Okay. All right, uh, so we're moving on.
So talked about a little bit of a memory, binary, the bit and byte, and the address is a location of uh, the instruction that I say inside the memory. So generally what we would have uh, in, uh, so things are gonna be stored in a memory and then every byte is gonna be an address. So I can go to a specific byte and pick up something. So when I have, uh, when I have my memory, the memory, remember I said that my whole program is not gonna fit in the, in the memory. So every program is gonna have minimum requirement of how much of a memory does it need. And the, generally the program is gonna be divided in three sections. So my code, my instruction is gonna come in into the first section. That's where my instruction is gonna be saved. Uh, not all of them, just a block of the bunch of block of my instructions gonna be there. That's where it's gonna be uh, my code. Then I'm gonna have a location for my data. And there's gonna be a location when I'm running my program. So it's gonna be a temporary location when I'm running my program. I'm not gonna go through the detail of it right now, but that's the way things are gonna happen. So if I want to go execute, uh, uh, if I wanna go and execute, so my instructions is over here. So I'm gonna pick up my first instruction from here. So it has to know where in the memory this first instruction is. So it's gonna have the address of it, uh, that what is the number of the bytes that is right there. And of course, the next instruction is gonna be next to it. So in, in our case, if I have 64 bit machine, if this address is 1 million, this one is gonna be 1 million 64 and so on. So forth. it's gonna add 64. In the data section, each one is gonna be the size of the data that they have. So if it's gonna have a variable, we're gonna talk about the variables. Uh, it's going to be right here, the next one, and the next one, and the next one is going to be there. So that, uh, to get to them, I need the address. Lucky for us, because it's high-level uh, programming, I'm not going to remember the address, and this address is going to change all the time anyway, because this time is on 1 million, next time is going to be on 2 million. Uh, I, uh, I don't have to worry about the addresses. I'm just going to create variables that's going to be turned into the addresses in when, 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 I, when I'm compiling my program, it's gonna be turning into the address. So I'm gonna have a variable called salary that's gonna have this address over here, but I don't have to remember where in the memory is, I'm just gonna say salary. And when I say salary, it's gonna go in here and it's gonna translate it to this address over here. So the way that the addresses are, is now it's starting with the zero, and then it's gonna just add one for every byte that it goes on. Uh, the reason that we're doing the zero, there is some reasoning behind it, but let's not get it complicated right now. And in real life, the addressing is upside down, but we are not gonna deal with that right now. It's gonna get a little confusing. So if this address is zero, the next one is one, two, three, four, and all the way down here, one million, one million, 64, and so on so forth. So that's the way the addresses are, we are, we are, it's just like you come to my street and I say my house is uh, house number five in this street. So first you're gonna to come to my street and then you're gonna to go to uh, house number five. So that's what happens with the base memory address. You come to that address and then you go to uh, number, byte number four and you're gonna get this one. So that's what the address is, is about. So we have our data and the data can be big uh, or small. Some of them are gonna be big and the C++ being efficient language, it's just gonna try ahead of time to say, okay, if you don't need as much memory, then we are not gonna give you that much memory. 
uh, and that's what why C++ has been around so long because it's been very efficient language. And uh, so before we run the program, the compiler is gonna go figure out how much room do we need in for the storage and uh, it's gonna assign that. So when I'm running my program, I don't have to worry about the storage is already there. So if I look at the data section of my uh, program, remember it's gonna have the code on the top. Uh, I'm looking at, I am looking at the memory. So when I get a piece of memory for my program, uh, first part is for the coding, second part is for my data. So some data is gonna take three bytes, some data is gonna take two bytes, some data is gonna take one byte and some, uh, you know, and, uh, so I'm gonna be declaring them right after each other. And it's, when I compile it, it's gonna go and reserve a space in the memory for those things for me. So if my address of my data section is 1 million, of course, it's never gonna be 1 million because it's always gonna have uh, some numbers at the end of it. But if it's a uh, 1 million, the first one is gonna be 1 million. The next one is 1 million, 1, 1 million, 2, 1 million, 3, 1 million, 4, and so on. So if I have three byte uh, for the first one, then this one is going to start at the fourth. So 1 million, 1 million, 1, 1 million, 2, 1 million, 3. So it's just 1 minus 4 minus 1 that's going to give me the address of this. So I will have a base plus this. Questions on this? So they find out that this binary thing is not working very well for everybody. I mean, at that time, people were thinking binary. Programmers were thinking binaries. So they figured out, okay, maybe we should do it a little different. Maybe we should have some way to change the binary to English and English to binary or some other things. They came up with this uh, table. It's called ASCII table. And this ASCII table is an appendix uh, at the end of your book. So that is gonna have like a map that what keys are gonna be mapped to what. Uh, so how many bytes is this? How many bytes is this? Wake up. Right. How many byte is this one? Wake up, wake up, wake up. How many bytes? Wouldn't it just be one byte because it's eight digits, like a binary? No, eight good. bits. Yeah. Very good. One byte right. is eight bits. So this is only one byte because it's only eight bit. ASCII table is using seven bit. And the last one is reserved for checksum. So it's going to be using seven bit generally. Let me see when we're going to talk about this. So we Okay, my phone, okay, 839, okay, we have time. I'm, I'm trying to think how much we should talk today about these things. So if I look at the decimal number, which was created in Middle East, some people call it Arabic system, so the numbers in the system that we are using is uh, based on 10. That means that I have numbers from zero to nine. And if I wanna go to, so I have numbers from zero to nine as a one digit. And when I get to nine and I wanna go to the next digit, I'm gonna shift over 
and I put a zero in there. So that is 10 in base 10 numbering. So if I have 385, what I do is I say it is three times 10 to the power of uh, uh, two uh, plus uh, eight times 10 to the power of uh, one uh, plus five times 10 to the power of zero. So as I go from right to left, my digits are gonna be multiplied by 10. So 10 to the zero, 10 to the one, 10 to the two, 10 to the three, that's the way we're gonna use the binary system. I mean, the regular numbering system, base 10. Now binary is base two. When we say base two, That means I cannot have two as a digit. I can have only zero and I can only have one. So if I go to one, I wanna to go to the next one, it's gonna be one, zero. I shift to the left, I put a zero on it. Because this is base two, one zero is gonna give me two. Remember in base 10, one zero would have given me 10. Base two, one zero is gonna give me two. Have you guys seen that the t-shirt some people wear, there are one zero types of people, the ones who understand binaries and the ones who don't. So one zero in binary means two. And what they are saying is there is only two types of people. They understand binary and they don't understand binary. So the fact that one zero is two in binary and some people don't know it, I guess that's what they're talking about. So if I am going to make this to a, a decimal number, I'm gonna start with the first one, which is two to the zero, which is always one. And I multiply to two as I go to the left. So that's gonna be one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128. So I'm just multiplying and instead of thinking about what two to the eight, two to the six, I'm just multiplying by two. So one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. So this is 64 plus one, that would give me 65 as a decimal number. So if I go to ASCII table, I can look at the binary one, or I can look at the number 65, and that's gonna give me the uppercase A. So it is 65. Now, the one next to it so if i have so if i have 0 1 1 0 0 0 how many is that one, three, three, six. Okay, this one. What does this give me? Zero, one, one, zero, 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 one. What is that in decimal number? 87? No. This is one, two, four, eight, 16. This is 32. This is 64. So it's gonna be 64 plus 32 plus one, which is? 96. ID seven. So they call this bit as a shift. So if it's on, mean it's lowercase. 
When it's off, it's uppercase. So the difference between the uppercase and lowercase is 32. So 65 is uppercase A, 97 is lowercase A. If you look at the ASCII table, that's the way is it in the decimal. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it uh, like that for now. I am now, let me see what we got in here. What do I see? So uh, we talked about the main memory. That's the only thing that the CPU sees. That's what is called main memory. Uh, the, whatever I need to run at the runtime has to be in the main memory. Otherwise it's not gonna work. So if I get the virus, my instructions in the main memory is not correct. That's why I cannot run a program or in the case of operating system, I cannot run my program. So it has to be in the main memory to be run. Secondary memory is anything but main memory. Uh, so it can be your hard drive, it can be USB drive, a DVD drive, whatever we have in there. So hard disk are not as fast as memory, but it's much cheaper. So we need to use those. I don't know if anybody remember floppy disk, compact disk. I'll let you guys to read those stuff. Uh, random access means I can go to a specific, remember this part for your test. Uh, random access, I can go to a specific location and uh, find it. A sequential, I have to go through it. So if I say our classroom is in R207, you cannot just jump into the R207. You have to go to the second floor. You have to start with certain number and you have to keep going till you get to the R207. You cannot just jump in there. But if you are on the first floor, you don't have to go sequentially. You can just go to the, to the uh, classroom right there. So random access, you can just access it directly. Uh, sequential, you have to go through it. So uh, in my time, we had tapes. So if I wanted to find a song to play, I had to rewind the tape at the beginning and look for the song that I wanna play. I could not jump directly to the song I wanna play. So that's the time we had, that's a sequential. I still use, they're using those for uh, storage uh, because you don't look for things for the backup, for the backup storage. They still use tapes because it's very, very cheap and they don't need to look for things constantly. They only need it when something goes wrong. So they would use it for the backup. So we talked about this uh, operating system. So we have our program, we're gonna be writing the program. This program is gonna need some data. So uh, the uh, program is gonna process this data through the computer and it's gonna give us some output. High level languages, more closer to the English language. So we don't have to worry about the binaries and those kind of things. Uh, C++, C have been around for a long, long time. Java came after this to, uh, to get uh, some things differently. Uh, I was trained on Pascal, it was a good language, but didn't last long. Uh, so some of these uh, languages out there, high level. This is assembly language. You will learn that uh, if you are a computer science or computer engineering, or electrical engineer, you're gonna learn assembly language. Uh, so the add X, Y, Z has to take the X to a location next to the CPU, it's called the register. And it's gonna, uh, so the instructions can be different depending on the system that's using it. So in this case, it's gonna add X to Y and it's gonna store it in Z. 
So an instruction is going to look like this. So this is called instruction. This is only four, 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 16 bit. They don't want to put a huge one. It's going to get us uh, confused. So the first part is going to tell what needs to be done. So when the CPU sees this instruction, it's going to look at the 0, 1, 1, 0. It says, okay, 0, 1, 1, 0 means I have to add something. And when I want to add something, I have to know what is it that I'm adding to what. And that's where you're going to spend some time to learn more about these things. So these are the addresses of my registers, which are uh, a small memory next to the CPU so for the storage. So that's where we're going to do these kind of things. It's funny that I, when I first started in PCC, we were spending two, three weeks on these things. I don't think we need that right now. So we write the program in a high level language, and then we're gonna use the compiler. The compiler job is two things. Again, be sure you know this for your test. Compiler job is two things. One is gonna check the syntax. Syntax is like a grammar. So I'm gonna have a checker that's gonna check my grammar first. So I'm writing something, it's gonna go in there and it's gonna check the grammar. The grammar means what? That my code is in line with C++. So we're gonna learn that and we're gonna figure out as we go along uh, that it's gonna check that. If the grammar is correct, then it's gonna, uh, compile it to machine language, which is uh, zeros and ones. And when we are running that the machine language, it's gonna need some data that can come in from the user or from a file or from a database somewhere that's gonna take that data and it's gonna give us some output. So my program is gonna add a two number and it's gonna display the result. So the two number, it may come in from the user. So when I'm running the program, it's gonna ask for two numbers and somebody's gonna type in two numbers and then I'm gonna add it, I'm gonna display the result. So sometimes, a lot of times, uh, we don't have to recreate things that's gonna be there. Uh, we might have uh, some, uh, uh, code that is already compiled. I don't have to compile it again. So we can reuse those things through the linker to add it to our program. So we can have potentially some code that's already compiled. It's not part of my program, but I can add it to my program uh, through the linker before complete machine learning. I'm not going to go through the history. You can read that on your own. Uh, how much time do we have? Okay. So algorithm is a sequence of precise instruction that leads to a solution. You can think about it that when you go solve a calculus problem, you have to go through certain steps to get that derivative or multi-derivative or something that you're trying to do. So it's the instructions of how do you get the solution? And of course, our program is going to be that steps, those steps in a specific language. So we need to do this one, this one, and this one to get this result. So if I want to, how many times a name occurs in the list, I have to set up certain steps. So first one is getting the list. Second one is what is it that I'm checking? Uh, then I'm gonna set the counter to zero. And then we're gonna be 
looking at the first one, second one, third one. And as soon as I find it, I'm going to get the answer back. So these are the steps that we're going to be using to get our algorithm done. So when we are designing our program, and I am a fund of design, so we're going to be pressing on that one a lot, uh, the question is going to come up. It says, okay, what is it that coming into it? What is going out of it? And how is it organized? So we can think about it as a manufacturing. So if I have a manufacturing uh, and uh, for a manufacturing, I'm gonna have some raw data that's coming into my manufacturing. And then I have my product that's going out of this. And then I'm gonna do this process. So in general, we might uh, call it IPO that is input processing output. So the data is gonna to come to me, I'm gonna process it, and I'm gonna have an output to point out. So the processing part is what we're gonna be doing in part of our program. Questions so far? Okay, I do have another class right after this class. So if you have some questions, you gotta to talk to me right now or tell me, because I cannot stay very long after the class is over today. So Fridays, I have a class right after this one. I cannot stay long. On uh, Monday and Wednesday, I can stay longer, but on Fridays, I cannot. And I'm gonna set up uh, office hours so you guys can come in and talk to me during the office hours. Okay, so we talked about these things and we talked about, okay, we're gonna have a start. Problem definition. So I have to understand what the problem is before I wanna give it the solution. A lot of us don't do that. We just jump in to try to give a solution without listening what the problem is. So we have to understand the problem. So with the lab or basically the practice is reading out loud. So when I say to practice that with your lab partner is you will read out loud a problem and try to process it to see if you really understand the problem. Because if you don't understand the problem, you cannot give me a good solution. And that's what uh, you, you gotta do with your lab partner. I have assigned you a lab partner already, and you're supposed to be talking to your lab partner already to do your work by tomorrow night. So uh, we're gonna build up some kind of a, a design uh, for our algorithm. How do we approach it? And then we're gonna be doing some testing. I'm not gonna go through this. We are not gonna go through this. So the last part that I wanna cover is the C++. So we're gonna introduce this and then we're gonna be uh, doing it together. So when we write a program in C++, it's gonna look something like this. And I'm gonna go over it and then we're gonna do one together. So this one is display 1.8 and we're gonna be doing this together. Let me explain to you what's going on and then we can do it. Okay, before I do that, I want to go over, where did you go? Okay, so I put this out there. Some of you might have some issues. Let me go over the, I'm hoping that all of you guys have downloaded the compiler and uh, IDE. Let me show you a couple of them so we can, uh, we can uh, work with it. So the code block uh, is one of them uh, that you can go to a binary release of uh, code blocks. And if you go to the binary release, it's gonna have uh, different ones. 
And what I was telling you guys on Wednesday is when you're downloading the IDE, you have an option of just the IDE or the compiler. So in here, it says Ming W, that is a compiler. So I'm gonna be using this one for the first time. And when I wanna update it in the future, I don't need the compiler anymore. I'm gonna go use this one. So I can click on this one or that one, but I need the compiler. So I don't need the ID by itself. And when I click on one of these uh, sources, it's gonna download. What I like about code blocks is very light. It is not heavy and it's gonna be very easy to install and easy to use. The other one that I was talking about is called the JetBrain. It has all kinds of IDEs, including the educational ones. So if you go to JetBrain and download the C Lion, this is getting popular among the students. They like the environment, they like the colors and the things that they can do with it. So the C Lion would be the version for C++ that some people want to use it. And if you don't want to download anything on your computer, you can use online compilers uh, like, like uh, REPL. REPL. Uh, so you can just type in your code and run it. Uh, so if I run it, it's going to uh, take a little time and it's going to print it. So those are the options that we have. So if I go to an example of a code block or C lion. So when you're installing your, your IDEs, you can, where do you go? So when you're installing your IDE, there are some options that you can check. Uh, one of them is gonna be, if you wanna, in this case, you wanna have a icon on your desktop, <clears throat> if you want to open the folder for a project, uh, don't have to worry about it too much right now. And the associations for those things. And when you install it, generally they're going to ask you what directory you want to install it in. So this is, I'm talking in general, and then you're going to go with your specific or your uh, IDE. Uh, they all have these things. They might be in a different location, different things. So if you go to go, uh, let's say I'm gonna create a new project. So I'm gonna go create new project. Uh, in uh, here, I'm gonna be using the console application. That's what we're gonna be doing for uh, this class. So I'm gonna check the console application. I'm not gonna use any GUI or anything like that. It's gonna be a C++. It's gonna tell me what's gonna be the name of my project, the name of another file, the name of the project. I'm gonna say sample or project one. Then it's gonna tell me what directory do I want it in. So most of the ID is gonna have their own directory. Most of them, they put it in for PC in my document in, Mac, they put it in uh, some directory somewhere else. And this is gonna be called my working directory. So every time you create a new project, it's gonna go in there and it's gonna create a folder for that specific project. And uh, it's gonna tell you what uh, kind of compiler is using. So we have different option. I would just leave it out. I mean, if you download whatever you download, it's okay, it doesn't really make that much difference for us. Uh, and then I'm gonna say finish. So right now in this one, I have two projects, one, two. The one that's highlighted is the one that I'm running. So if I have multiple projects, maybe at the beginning, you just wanna have one project at a time so it doesn't confuse you. And later on, you can add more to it. The confusion is you might be looking at this one uh, but you're actually running the other. Let me see what is the message over here. Does a Cilion come with a compiler? Again, you have an option of having a compiler or not having a compiler. You gotta look to see what you are downloading. Uh, so if I go to here and I go to JetBrain, uh, a C Lion cross platform 
there are more. In there, it's gonna tell you if it's coming with the compiler or not. I just downloaded it so I can test it. Uh, C lion, run C lion, finish. So now we're gonna we're gonna be doing this right now. So we're gonna be typing this program. We're gonna type this program and we're gonna run it together. Okay, this is what we're gonna do. It's basically the typing part. So I'm gonna tell you what's going on here, and all you're gonna be doing is just typing to be sure it's gonna be working. So uh, we're gonna have this. Uh, everything has to be like that, otherwise your compiler is gonna complain about it. So we have a main, that's the main program. On the top, you're gonna to have a pound include and using namespace, we explain these things later. And uh, you're gonna be typing this one, display 1.8 in your IDE, and then you're gonna compile it. When you run it, this is gonna be happening. So that's what we're going to be doing right now. Any questions about what we're doing right now? So open up your IDE, type this thing in, uh, and then uh, run it, see what happens. If you have any issue, if you have any problem, let me know. So most of the time, the first time you're typing things, when you, it doesn't run, when it complains, generally is because we didn't type it correctly. So, Professor, I have a question. Uh, give me one second. Are you done? Uh, and then single answer, yes or no. Uh, save. Before I answer a question, I'm just doing a poll to see uh, who is done, who is not done. So just uh, respond back to the uh, to the poll. 
I just want to know where we are. Okay, we got we got quite a few people who are still working on it. Okay, that's fine. Who had a question? I did. So you okay. you mentioned before that we have lab partners, and I assume I didn't get one since I wasn't here on Wednesday. Is there anywhere that I can sign up for one, or would you have to give me one? Let me check it out. Okay, so we know how to get to group. That's gonna be the people. I gotta go over that. Uh, we do the lab one. Did you join yourself to this group? I don't think so. I might have. I think I only joined an activity, but Nobody joined me. Okay, so the well, you had a partner, but that partner is gone. So I'm looking for. Okay, the. Give me, give me, give me a couple of minutes to figure that. Okay, for those who are having problem with the code, I mean, I, I can understand. I'm, I'm not very good typist, so it's gonna take me longer to do. If you have any issues, we can talk about it. If it's just a matter of typing, maybe we can uh, postpone it so we be sure you have enough time to get some of these things done. Let's take, a, I don't know, a couple of more minutes to get the, as much of it as done. Remember, we have our DQ that you can always come back and ask questions, but you gotta get this done right away. We don't want to postpone this too long. So I'm giving you guys a couple of minutes to wrap it up as much as you can. Are you guys on Discord? I am. Yes. Why do I get the message from people on Discord? I guess somebody invited me somewhere. I did not have a compiler downloaded. I uh, see Lion and CodeBlocks came with a download. Okay. Gabriel.
Okay, let's just stop uh, with what you're doing and you can finish it after the class. And uh, there is a Discord going on, so you guys can sign up uh, with Discord to check with other students what they're doing. Okay. For the learning team, you were supposed to come to the people. Your uh, view is a little different than mine. You guys don't have these tabs up there for some strange reason, uh, but uh, you will go to lab one and then you would find yourself and then you would know who your partner is. And you should have done this by now. You should have been talking to your uh, uh, lab partner. Generally, you wanna start this on Wednesdays or even Tuesdays to be sure you are gonna establish some, some kind of a communication do not wait till Saturday. You are not gonna have enough time to do it. So right now, if you haven't talked to your partner, it's already too late. Now, do you have, is anybody here doesn't know how to find your partner? Is anybody here doesn't know how to find a partner? Uh, I don't know how to find my partner. Who is that? Gabriel Parker. Okay, you go to the people. Let me go back. You were not here on uh, Wednesday? I was here on Wednesday. So you go to people. Okay. And you're going to see the groups. You're going to be looking for lab. Uh, I, I don't like this, but that's the way the canvas is. So you have to scroll down all the way to the lab. And then you got to find yourself over here. So you're going to be looking at, uh, you know, these things. I, I think you, one of these things should have some kind of indication that you are in a group and then you can get hold of your lab partner. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So that's the way you're doing. But the problem that we have right now in hand is we have odd number of people. So we have uh, Brian here that doesn't have a group. So do any of you have any issue getting hold of your lab partner or your lab partner has a left already and you cannot get hold of it? Anybody in the class that is having a hard time to communicate with your lab partner? You guys gotta let me know. You cannot tell me tomorrow evening that the, your lab partner is not gonna get back to you and you cannot get the things done. These things has to be, has to have happened already. So everybody's good. Everybody's talking to your lab partner right now. That's a scary. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a question for the whole class as well. Did were was everyone aware uh, we were supposed to be? We were already assigned and supposed to be looking at the book for the programs because that that kind of got lost on me personally. Say what again? You were assigned what? Um, I know you had said that we were going to get assigned lab partners, but, uh, I never got, um, an actual notification that we were, so I wasn't sure when we were actually going to start working on it, but I understand that, uh, the expectation was to already okay. the, the, this, this problem is not going to be that hard. It's just going to be similar to what we're doing is basically typing and stuff. So it's just, it takes time. Fine. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest part is to get hold of your partner. I understand that. And I think I put it, I give you guys a little more time this week. So you can overlap with Sunday if you need to. Uh, I'll be okay. And if you need more time, let me know. We figure it out. The first couple of weeks is just the adjustment that we need to do. And then you would know this moving forward. Um, I had a question, Professor. Sure. So since it's a group work, um, are the source codes supposed to be the same or are they supposed to be different from the partner? Very good. So what I ask you guys to do for the lab is to switch back and forth about reading up lab. So you guys going to, one person is going to listen, the other person is going to read the problem. So when you start reading the problem, you're going to think of lab. Uh, it says that I have to add two numbers. Where do these two numbers come from? If it's coming from the user, where do I get it? How do I get it? And when I add it, how do I display it? Do I need to do anything about it? So you're going to be thinking out loud and the other person is going to be just listening. 
And after you did that, then when you guys come up with the, and I put an announcement in there. Didn't I give you guys an announcement on that? Remember the announcement is something that you guys are supposed to read. Peer review or Zoom meeting, welcome to, I guess I didn't put it in the announcement. So every group is gonna have one submission. So when you submit, it's gonna be a group product. So one submission, either one of you gonna do it, and that's gonna be for the whole group. So you do not submit two. So the design, the first part has to be together. If you do the code separately, which I don't like to do it, at the end, you have to agree with that code. So if I ask you what happened in this code, you should not tell me my partner did it, I don't have no clue. That is not a good answer. This is your group product. So you gotta know everything. It's just only one submission. When you submit, the whole group is gonna get a submission. I need somebody to adopt Ryan. I think someone mentioned they don't have a partner. Who does not have a partner? Is anybody here who is having a hard time getting hold of your lab partner? I know Justin didn't know what's going on. Really calling me out there. <laughs> Anybody? Ashka, do you know your partner? Uh, yes. Well, we can we can add um, Brian. We'll take okay. him. Yeah. Brian, you're going to be talking to Ashka and Angel. That's all right with me. Good. Okay. So that's for that one. Uh, what did I want to say before we leave? So that's for the lab. Please, please put your questions in the DQ so we can all answer it. You go in the DQ, you see a question, try to answer it. That way, you don't have to wait for me to come back. Uh, take a look at this example. The problem in chapter one is not big deal. It's just the typing part of it. You just basically kind of copy what we, we were typing right now. Uh, and then you just modify it a little bit. So uh, if you have any questions, if you have any problem, post it in the DQ. I try to get back to you as soon as possible or other students gonna get back. So you have a few minutes before I leave. Uh, any questions for the last couple of minutes? Justin, are you the only child or you are the last child in the family? I am the middle child. Middle child cannot blame other people for their own shortcomings. I, I was generally the anybody. last child in the family to do that. Oh uh, yeah, I'm aware, but no, I wasn't. <laughs> for We're gonna be using some psychology over here, and since oh, you yeah. talk, I pick up, pick up uh, you. That's I got it. hit. I got hit with the uh, oh, is anybody a middle child here? Rose my hand. And hey, I'm a middle child. Up. It's always somebody else's fault. It's never my fault. There you go. The, no, I did this, the, first week, the first week is usually like that till you guys get hang up things. And it's going to be things that I think I told you guys I didn't tell you, or you, I might put it somewhere you didn't read it. That's okay. I mean, the first week or two, that's the way it's going to be. And then after the third week, we don't have no excuses. You always, you know, it can be always me not thinking about something and telling you guys something might not be the same thing. So you can always blame me. That's okay. Anything else? Uh, yes, Laura. I uh, tried to contact my partner, but I just haven't gotten a response yet. I just asked like 50 times. Uh, I know. I was. <laughs> what group <laughs> I didn't are you in? say anything. I was waiting because I messed What group them. are you in? You remember group number? Uh, I just looked. Um, what number? Oh, one second. Laura, Laura, why, why can't I see you? What number? Four, I think. I'm checking. Laura, Zishi, is Zishi here? Okay, I'm going to move Zishi from you. I'm going to give you back uh, Brian, since you both are here. 
So you guys can talk about it. And if Zishi show up for any reason, then we can pick yes, it up. Uh, yes, I'm here. So why are you not responding back to her? Wait, um... she, she, she shamed you in front of everybody. OK, I'm going to put you back to with uh, Laura. You guys got to be sure. I'm going to put back Brian. I'm sorry, Brian. I'm be moving you around. No, no, it's fine. So what's your excuse, Zishi? Why are you not responding back to her? Um, I can shame you in front of everybody. <laughs> uh, I'm not really familiar with um, Canvas yet, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, get familiar. Practices. Let's talk. Let's talk. We got to get these things uh, cleaned up. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I know we're going to have some issues, but oh, well. ignoring is not a good issue. So you got to respect yourself. You got to respect your partner. I'm not, I'm not putting on Zishi. I'm just saying in general, when you have a lab, it's not only you. I know in this week, we have a short week. And that's why we are kind of cleaning these things up. Yeah. But in your lab, you're we'll responsible for you and somebody else. So please be responsive. Uh, get back together as soon as possible. Do not wait for tomorrow. Okay, I gotta go. I gotta get uh, to my other class. Thank you very much. Post your questions on the DQ, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Don't worry about it too much. You're gonna get it done. Thank you, Professor. All right, take care. Goodbye. What is Jonathan doing? Thank you. Thank you, hey. Professor. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. I'm gonna be talking two more hours. Professor, I also have a quick question. I'm sorry, I gotta go. I have another oh, okay. class. Can I email you my question? Email me question. If it's private, if it's public, put it in a DQ. Okay, thank you. What is your question anyway? Um, I didn't see my lab partner in the Zoom call either, so I wasn't sure if he, he was still. I in think class. I think this is a bad time to do lab partners. Yeah, everything is bad, but we're gonna figure it out. So go back to that people. Uh, it's there. Everybody has a lab partner. Everybody's gonna have somebody. So go back I, I know who my lab partner is, but I haven't seen him in the Zoom meeting. That's why I ask like five times if your lab partner is. I, I, I'm really sorry. I have to get back to my other class. Uh, if he's not responding back to you, or she's not responding back to you in a couple of hours or so, uh, just let me know and I move people around. So if your lab partner is not responding back to you in about, I don't know, three, four hours or less than that, let me know. I can move people around. Okay, I gotta go, I'm sorry, goodbye.